Hi guys, this is Akshay from the Scale Up Podcast and we've got another incredible guest lined up today. Now this guest is CEO of Fotero Group, chairman of Forbes Family Group, voted one of the most influential black people in the power list 21 and 22, named as one of the most influential top 50 business leaders. He's had exits of over $2 billion in his career. Dean Forbes. Big, uh, big intro, thank you. No, I'm so happy to have you. So we actually met on my You're Fired show and you're one of the panelists. That's right, yeah. yeah. And one thing I did want to share with you before we do get started is I remember having a conversation with you backstage and you were asking me about my career, what my plans were for the future. And I was there telling you that, Dean, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and you just said one thing to me that really stuck with me and really inspired me. And that was actually... Just do what you've been doing that got you on The Apprentice. Right, right. And I was like, he's so right. I <laughs> don't need to overcomplicate it Good. and just focus on what's working. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. But no, I'm excited to have you here. Dean, there's so much I want to speak to you about, about your career, how mm. you've scaled up in life. But I want to take it back to your early days on who Dean really was back in the day <laughs> and what your first job was, what your childhood was like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because the the difference between life now and when I was growing up, it, you know, it couldn't be couldn't be a bigger contrast. I grew up in South London, um, mostly on housing estates. Although late, later in life, we we did you know manage to get a house, which we subsequently lost. So we had a, a couple of periods of kind of homelessness. Um, at the time, I didn't realize, but as an adult now, you look back and say, "Wow, you know, we were we were quite poor." But my mum did a brilliant job of insulating us from that. From that fact and it's only as an adult and parent now i look back and realize how hard life really was but as i said my mum did a good job of kind of just getting us through life and getting us to the next stage and keeping us clothed and fed that at the time i didn't really um didn't really realize but kind of coming through that situation and all the dif difficulties that come with not having a lot of money and you know losing the house uh twice um i ended up kind of via a failure in football um, going into tele sales at Motorola because I just had like, mountains of debt on me, which I'd accumulated right. uh, as a footballer, and I ended up yeah at, at Motorola doing tele sales, and uh, one thing led to another. Ended up in software, and boom, you know. <laughs> I have so many questions just based on the fact you said that. I want to take it back a little bit more before Motorola, mm -hmm. and you spoke about the fact that you were homeless at one point, and yeah. today you're CEO of a company that does over fifty million pounds in annual turnover, uh -huh. probably more by now. Yeah, yeah, we're doing 200. 200, 200 million. okay, so times four. That's what you call scaling up. Um, when you were homeless at that time, your your mindset, and when you sort of look back, did you ever think that you'd be in this position? So was that drive always there within you that I am going to do well, regardless of what my circumstances are right now, this is what I want, this is what I'm going after, or was it organic? Uh, it... it kind of happened in two ways actually right. you know, when when we were homeless as i mentioned my mum was brilliant at just moving us through these different cycles in life so when we were homeless we kind of knew it wasn't great we were living in a lived in a hostel for a, for a period but my mum was always forward facing in terms of all oh, right it's just six months we'll get out of it don't worry right. the games and she made it kind of not feel so oppressive um, and I wasn't particularly driven at that point, I don't think, other than, right. again, you know, my mum was always get straight A's, you know, okay. do well at school, that kind of thing. When I failed at football and all of my friends went on to succeed or a lot of them went on to succeed and some of them went on to do really, really well in football, right. it was kind of that failure that, that you know, drove me on, right? Because I, I didn't want to be the person in the group who didn't have anything to bring to the table. I didn't want to be one of the people just hanging around the successful people. Yeah. And I was embarrassed and had a bit of pride that, you know, I just couldn't let that happen. And it, and it was kind of that reaction that started this, uh, oh, this journey. Yeah. And it's so interesting you say that. And I always say is that your circle is, is sometimes your benchmark. Absolutely. That the people that you have around you have to be doing better than you sometimes or, or be on the, like what you said, bring to the table. Yeah. Is that because those conversations that you have with those people, will really impact Absolutely. how you grow through. Absolutely. I, I always say your your circle is kind of the soundtrack to your life, right? So I love that. If, if you have people around you and all they're talking about is, you know, negative things and yeah. and losses and perhaps doing things which aren't um, you know, particularly aspirational, hmm. then it's really hard to imagine your life exceeding that 
soundtrack that you hear and you're in every single day. Correct. Whereas my circle of friends, irrespective of kind of financial success, right. everybody's doing something positive. Everybody's trying to do something better tomorrow progress. than they did today. There's so much progress happening. Yeah. So you, you can't be in that circle if you want to complain about what no. the world owes you or you know you want to complain about how people have poorly treated you. Right. Because everybody else is talking about the next good thing Absolutely. that they want to do. So I, I agree with you. I think it's so important that the soundtrack to your life is positive, forward-facing aspiration. Absolutely. And I just want to add one more thing while we're talking about this is sometimes you think you're doing really well. Sometimes you think you're smashing life. Right. However, it depends on who you're around. Exactly. If you're a millionaire around... Billionaires. Around billionaires, yeah. you're like, damn, I need to get put my game up. Oh, because, absolutely. You know, I, I was... Um, it's a funny story when we when we sold the last company. I know I know you want to come onto it. Part of the group who bought that company it, it's run by a very very successful okay. uh, billionaire. And I was really happy with my life, really happy with yeah. where I got to, really happy with myself financially. Right. And then I went and spent time with him as part of the deal in his house, in right. his setup, seeing how he lives. And right. I came away thinking, I failed. Like what have I, you know, what have I been doing with my life <laughs> up until now? But I love those situations because they open up a whole new world to try and live up to. Absolutely. It's mindset as well. It's a bit like how I feel with you right now. <laughs> it's like, damn, I need to level up in life. <laughs> nice. What would you say to someone who's watching this right now that's in a sales environment? I developed a good way of explaining my product or proposition right. in a way that wasn't about me or, or our company, but more about the other person. I see. Right? So I, I rarely talked about, you know, this is a black microphone. It can pick up sound from this radius. You know, it costs this much. Yeah. I talked more about how it was going to be used, how you were going to use it. Right. Why you having it and using it was going to be great for your podcast and how your podcast was going to then grow and, right. and the growth of that podcast was wonderful for Akshay. Right. Right. So this thing is part of your journey and, right. and success as opposed to kind of, you know, describing it in... Instead of the benefits, you're actually relating it back to what problems it's solving. For exactly. And why the individual. person or business, you know, ought to care mm. about that. No, absolutely. So you're a telesales on Motorola. Mm. What's next for Gene Forbes? Um, well, I spent a lot of time hiding at Motorola because I hated it. Like coming from playing football and <laughs> working in Rome, it's quite different. Right. Um, but then people were laughing at me, and I, I've told that story a few times. As, you know, people just realised I wasn't doing well, and they kind of laughing. Um, so then that forced me to succeed. Okay. And I ended up at an American software company okay. with private equity investors okay. that wanted to grow in Europe. Okay. Um, and I kind of jumped on that train and and was really aggressive in terms of pushing my career, and they supported me, and I ended up running the international part of that business, which eventually sold to Oracle for $550 million. $550 million. Was that your first exit? That, that was the first exit I was, I remember the executive board that, that wow. drove that exit and I had equity in that company. So it just opened my mind to technology, right. scaling up, doing investments, having equity, and then the wealth creation that that came with that. And once that happened, I was addicted. <laughs> yeah. I was you, absolutely you, you've repeated the exits multiple times. Now, obviously, you've done over $2 billion in exits, which I want to come on a little bit more. But how were you feeling when you had that first exit? Because obviously, you've had that tough childhood. Mm -hmm. you, you, your football career hasn't gone as to plan. Yep. Your friends are doing better than you. It's like, bam, you know what? <laughs> were you like, I've made it now. Yeah. That's it. Or were you, were you more like, okay, fine. I want more. I had a, a few different emotions. The first thing that happened mm. after that was I went and bought my mum a house. I love that. Right. So that was just. I love that. That's one of my goals. Incredible emotion for yeah. me and mum, the journey we'd had, um, yeah. you know, being able to make sure she would never have that experience again. So, so that was emotional. Then I paid off all of my debts and my mortgages. So that was kind of emotional. Then I reverted to type and spent money wildly on things. That <laughs> probably. What's the craziest thing you bought? At one point, I had uh, six cars. I love cars. Which cars? <laughs> I, had, I had six cars. I had a, I had a Mini Cooper S. I had a nice. TVR Tuscan. I had a Mercedes CL AMG. I had a Bentley GT. I just had all of these cars. Yeah, and, yeah. and I was reveling in coming out every day and choosing which car to drive. And cars are terrible things to buy because they just, Liability, they yeah. just depreciate yeah. so quickly. Um, and then I learned about tax. And I learned about currency because I got paid, you know, millions in US dollars. 
Um, you lost money in the conversions. And then I lost a lot of money in the conversions, which I hadn't really fought through. Right. And then I had to pay tax the next year, which I hadn't really fought through. So I see. A, a big headline number became a very small number. Pretty, you know, it I was see. still meaningful, but, but pretty small. Right. And then at that moment, I was just kind of like a bit sad, but I thought, okay, well, I want to just go, just go and do it again. Do just, it again. Yeah, just go do it again. What I love the most, um, just based on speaking to you so far, is it wasn't a case of, hey, I've made it. That's it. I'm going to oh, just never. sit yeah. on the beach. You're still after that next yeah. exit or the next thing you're doing in your life. Yeah. So you've done your 550 mil um, exit. What was the next thing you did once you decided that you're ready to go after the next project? Yeah. So the, the 550, I was a part of the executive board. So I wasn't the CEO I see. that okay. did that, right? So the, the next thing I wanted to do is, is do that, do an exit as a CEO. Okay. And uh, I became known among technology private equity investors right. based on the work I did at that company. Right. So I got offered a job to be CEO of a Paris based tech company. Nice. That, you know, was finding its feet, wasn't wasn't doing too great. And this was my opportunity to prove that that one wasn't a fluke. And, you know, I really did make that happen and that I could do it again. So, yeah. so I took that job. Uh, that took us seven years to turn that business around and we sold it to American Express for um yeah, hundreds of hundreds of millions. Wow! So you did it again as well. Mm. So at that at that point, your confidence has just gone up completely because you've done it twice now. But you said that you turned it around after seven years. So was it a failing business at the time? It, it was a really good product, okay. really good company. It wasn't making profits, and it okay. wasn't growing as quickly um, as you know it, it, it needed to. Yeah. Expected. And just out of interest, this, this is more for me, that when you go into this sort of company and you see that, okay, the numbers can be better, what are the key things you look at on a top line basis that you think, wow, okay, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done? What's typically the most important change that you see mostly? The two things which are always kind of key to me in these things is, you know, the team. I see. Right? So, uh, you know, ordinary teams never achieve extraordinary things. So you need a really good team, especially in a downward facing right. scenario, you need an extraordinary team. Um, and then the second thing is the plan, right? So having a really, really well thought out, robust plan, not because you expect everything to go according to plan, but just yeah. because when it stops going according to plan, you want to know immediately. And if you don't have a plan, I see people kind of, reinvent success based on what happened right? Right. Oh, so we should have had five million in profit and 15 million in sales right we got 20 million in sales but we didn't make any profit but wow you know our sales are great well hang on a second there was a reason you know it should have been those two numbers i do, see do, do you see what i mean and the plan kind of stops you from losing track of where you are and reinventing success based on what you know what right. just happened no, that, that makes complete sense. And at this stage, you've done two exits. You're working probably long hours. Mm -hmm. um, there's two things I want to talk about. Firstly, the work work life balance element. But what was your what were some of the challenges you were facing while having these exits? Because obviously, it can't always just be perfect that you've gone in a company and it's <laughs> perfect. What were the challenges professionally and on your personal life at that stage? Oh wow! So. In both of those roles, the the first one at Primavera, which became Oracle, and the second one at KDS, um, Primavera was a I was responsible for what we call international, so everywhere outside of the Americas. Okay. So I would be traveling three weeks of the month. Wow. And then uh, at KDS, it was a French head Paris headquartered company. Right. So I would leave home late on a Sunday and come back Thursday evening. Right. So the biggest kind of issue we were facing as a family was time i was very absent right i was extremely absent and my children were born between the last in the last two years of primavera so they were very young right you know during that that first experience so that was hugely challenging for me my wife and our um and our family and so that was on the personal side on the professional side i was a young first time ceo trying to command the respect of people who were almost always older and more experienced right. uh, than me. And that hit me in you know, so many, so many different right. ways. That was difficult. No, wow, that's incredible. And um, in terms of you being um, named as one of the most influential black people uh, mm -hmm. in the power list, 2021 and 2022, yep. 
how did you first react or, or did that not really phase you? I um, I have been like anti those divisive lists. Like, that's how I viewed them. Okay. Um, for lo- for lots of reasons, you know, I don't want to see a a white power list. Right? I wouldn't I wouldn't want to see that. I don't I don't like accolades that divide us based on religion or or ethnicity. Correct. Right? I, I don't I don't like those things and haven't. So, you know, and the, being nominated to the power list, I kind of greeted it with that mindset a little bit. If I'm okay. on, if I'm honest, then something amazing happened. Right. I gave that list. To my kids, or my—I okay. don't know if I go to them, or they, they end up seeing it. Right. And I watch them cycle through their own aspirations based on who they saw in the list. The list right. right. Um, I saw them, you know, look at great entrepreneurs like Pam Brown, who who uh, Pat Brown, sorry, who is in the cosmetic space, you know, right. multi-billion-euro business. I watch my daughters become curious about that because the person looked like them. I watched uh, my son realize that there are many opportunities for him outside of football, which is where his current passions are because of the relativity of the list. And it hit me how needed that was among young people yeah. and how much, how much good my presence on that list could do for a 17, 18 year old Dean. And it completely changed my view of those lists. And it made me appreciate how necessary they are for, um, kind of underrepresented and, and minority groups. Right. No, I completely agree. I think there's a lot of young people that look up to you. And especially while well, I've been to the radar events that I do want to talk about later on, um, it's it's just incredible how much influence you can have unintentionally mm. by your yeah. daily actions that yeah. people are actually observing. And I think it's important to have that, especially in um, communities that don't actually have those people around them right. that are not easily accessible right yeah absolutely and, and it kind of dawned on me that and it's, it's a bit humbling that i can be that for you know for for someone else and and if i can i ought to and i should right so right. That's, that's kind of how i see it and that's why we have things like radar and other things no like absolutely that. i do want to touch back on that but i want to go back to the other conversation about work-life balance mm. now a lot of people say is that work-life balance is important. You need to have that balance and you need to keep it separate. What's your actual view on that? I think it's down to the individual. Right. right. I think it's down to the individual. The only thing on that topic I feel strongly about is right. you can't expect, you know, the outcomes and the trappings of working seven days a week if you only want to work four days a week. Right. right? If you If you want to work four days a week and have more time for, you know, other, other things, that's fine. But it's likely you're going to end up with less than the person who works six days a week in the same scenario, same Clear job, yeah. et cetera. So that's my only frustration that from time to time, you know, you come across people who are passionate about work-life balance, but they're passionate in the context of, I want to work less because I want to live more, but I want to be treated and compensated in the same way as those who are willing to work more. So, and I don't, I don't agree right. uh, with that. Personally, I love to work. Yeah. Right? Personally, so much of my personal identity is in my work. work, and I and I love that. So, I would work seven days a week if yeah. you know I didn't have family commitments, and if my wife would allow me to, I would work seven days a week because I love it. I, I love it so much. So, I'm not trying to get. Yeah. A work life balance at all, actually. Yeah. Because no, <laughs> yeah. I completely agree. And I find that question really interesting because personally, I think work life balance should be the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's that you love your work so much that you're not trying to actually balance it out. Right. It's that it actually feels like it's part of my life. Exactly. It's, it's part of your point. schedule. So that's, a good um, point. that's that's how I personally view it. It's a good point. One of the traits in business or as an entrepreneur is to have the ability to keep going. Yeah. Um, because you will get those challenges, but it's that you don't know what's around the corner of that challenge. Right. You can easily get knocked, knocked down. Absolutely. You don't want a what if moment either in your life. That what if I actually just had one more day yeah. that I tried yeah. to keep going. I, I take a lot of inspiration from sport as well. And I see <laughs> the greatest athletes almost always talk about recovering from the defeat yeah. quickly. Yeah. is a determinant of success. You lose the match, the fight, the race. You know, you need to be able to go back and train, practice, rehabilitate quickly. So you spend, in football terms, you know, five days of the next seven wallowing in the defeat. You're only spending two days preparing for the next victory, whereas 
you know, top footballers I know talk about getting over it by Sunday so that they can spend the rest of the week Correct. Get, getting ready. And I, I think that's such an important kind of mindset. No, I agree. And I think that's huge to have that in mm. any competitive environment. Now, going to your biggest exit, I read an article saying you've got a billion euro exit, right. which is absolutely incredible. Again, comparing from where you started. Yeah. I want to know more about that. Yeah, that that was amazing. So that happened in uh, happened on February 28th uh, this year. Oh, wow. So you remember the exact date as <laughs> I well. I remember the exact, uh, exact date. Um, and I came to Fortero by recommendation, which is something I'm really proud of, right? So somebody in the tech space recommended me to the investors of Fortero as somebody who could help them get a great exit. Right. Uh, and in my first meetings with the investors, they talked about their exit aspirations. And I remember saying to them, I think we can do, I think we can do better. I think we can do the, the billion. Uh, and it was kind of an 18 to 20 month process of building up to that. Um, so just kind of hugely rewarding. And in tech, a billion is, is a, is a, we call it unicorns, you know, companies value at a billion or more. Yeah. So being part of that you know, very elite club um, right. is really, yeah, really, really, really proud and humbled about that. Right. And right now, at this point in your life, where are you thinking, do you want another billion dollar exit? Or do you want to go for, are, are, you, are you happy? Are you content? No, no. No, I, no I'm, I'm a, I don't know. It's, it's weird because every good thing that's happened to me, I, I shake it off. I enjoy it and then shake it off quickly right. and ask myself the next question. I guess I was explaining this um, uh, yesterday to, to Sky. Um, I want to know where I fail. Okay. That, that's what's driving me at the moment. Like what is beyond my reach? Because, you know, if we go back 15 years, yeah. running a software company was unimaginable. I did, you know, I did it. Then exiting a software company, unimaginable. You know, creating a financial situation for my family that we have, unimaginable. So now I'm just trying to figure out where is the ceiling? Like what, what can I do? And I think when I get to that point, I'll say, okay, well, you know, one billion I could do, I could do four, which is my next target. Maybe I can't do 10 and I'm going to try and do 10. And if I do nine, I'll know. And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of tap out at, right. at that point. No, I love that. And I think what I see from that is that that's what's driving you. And you keep pushing that barrier yeah. forward. And it's so important to have that attribute because you can easily be like, that's it. Yeah. That's what, that's what I'm taking the most out of this podcast so far in terms of inspiration. It's that, no, there's more, there's more. Yeah. And you're saying that, what's that point that I can fail? But, I think that's just an element that you're looking at, but that's actually driving you forward. Yeah, I, and I mean, I don't, I don't want to fail. Right? It's no. not, I'm not, I'm not trying to. I don't want to. I don't want to fail. I think as well, actually, it's a lot about like horizons and what what you become aware of is possible. I, I, and I know it sounds, um, you know, a bit spiritual, but I remember being at KDS and being offered 65 million euros for that company. And it was at a very difficult time. And I remember going to our investor, uh, Harry Nellis at the time, and saying to him um, on his private plane, coming back from Paris at the time. Nice. And, um, and I was saying to him, look, Harry, and I'd orchestrated this meeting, I said, look, Harry, we've got this offer, 65 million euros. Things aren't really going well at the moment. It's very difficult. I don't know if we're gonna do well next year. I think this is a really good offer. And that would have been my first exit as CEO, and it would have been a 65 million euro exit and I'd spent a lot of the money that I'd earned from the last one. Right. So I didn't need the money, but it was it was going to be good to get some money from that exit. And I remember Harry saying to, like looking up from his um from his from his drink and saying to me, like, are you insane? If we sell this company for 65 million euros, you know, you you'll make a couple of euros, you'll a couple of million euros, you'll buy a holiday home, you know, you'll buy a smart watch and a Porsche, and then and then what are you going to do? And I remember, as he said it to me, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds pretty good, right? Exactly. Yeah, I want the you, Porsche. <laughs> you, you've got it, holiday home, Porsche, you know, a bit of money in the bank. Yeah. It sounds perfect. But he could not be more disgusted with me that that was the limit of my aspirations. And he said, you know, we're not going anywhere with this company until we get a 500 million euro offer. And I got off of the plane and I went back to work and I started hammering everybody at work saying, we've got to push to 500 million, you know, we're failing unless we get into that yeah. ballpark. Don't bring me this nonsense, uh, you know, the 65 million thing. 
and we didn't get anywhere near the 500, but we got more than double the 65, wow. which we would never have got if his horizon wasn't so much yeah. you know, higher than mine. And I've kind of taken that lesson. I live my life like that. I'm saying, you know, this kid from South London who has no right to be in the position that he's in is wondering if he can do a 10 billion euro exit. I mean, it's ridiculous, but wow. I'm going to give it a good, yeah. it's a possible. good shot. Right? It's possible. People are doing it. A good friend of mine did one this week for 9.2 wow. billion pounds. So it's possible. And I want to have a crack at it. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it comes back to those conversations with the right people. Yeah. You could have easily been on a different plane and someone says, yeah, take it, take grab it, it with your both right. hands. <laughs> and you'd have still been content with that, Absolutely. thinking you're a success. Exactly. But exactly. there's a higher level. Exactly. And I always, I always say this as well, like, um, obviously I've got a long way to go in my career compared to, compared to you, I can't compare. But there's always another level. There yep. is always another level, yep. a higher level that you don't know. And for me, it's that my biggest fear is um, one day after I die, I'm going to meet Akshay, who's a different level. Right. And if I'm not close to that Akshay, it's going to haunt me. It's going to bug me. <laughs> yep. There's an Akshay out there that I'm trying to chase who's doing much more. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're trying to... Do you have those with. people though? Do you feel like you've got people who are, you know, a level or two levels above you so they, they're far enough ahead that you, you aspire to do what they're doing, but not so far that... It's unimaginable yeah. to, to I'll be them. really honest. After The Apprentice, I've really been trying to put myself in those circles right. where I've got the visibility of access to those people mm. and going to dinners with them, lunch with them, going out with them for nights out yeah. and how they think, how they operate. Um, you have to have that. Yeah. Like I was out with um, a friend who spent £15,000 on a night out. It sounds silly and it's, mm. it is in a term, but I'm like, wow, he can spend £15,000 on a night out. Right. I want to do that, yep. not because I want to do it because it's, it's flexing, but yep. it's like, wow, for him, that's nothing. Yep. It's yep. it's nothing, yep. you know, for them, it's like, it's just not out. Yeah, and yeah. you want to be in that position to be able to make that, exactly. that choice. Exactly. One thing I want to speak about is, I know we're briefly talking and you said you recently partnered with a, a venture capitalist fund. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to know more about that project. But, yeah, that's a really interesting deal. So um, I'm now a, a partner at private equity company called Court and Capital. Okay. Um, and part of that deal with me becoming a partner at Court and Capital was that I get to bring uh, businesses run by underrepresented founders and entrepreneurs to Court and Capital to be uh, viewed for either investment or advice, right? Okay. And I'm so pleased, you know, that Joe and Simon have given me the opportunity to join, but also agreed that we can have these days where we bring these businesses through because okay. it's going to give people you know from the same backgrounds like me access to just incredibly smart investors who may invest um or they're just going to give them advice that they otherwise might struggle um to get so really proud that that's you know part of that deal but really looking forward to testing myself in a new theater again right, right. i've never been a an investor i've never been part of a private equity firm um so it's a new way for me to see is this something you know, is this something right. I can do? That sounds incredible. And congratulations for that, firstly. And Dean, I also saw recently you were at a private party with Rishi Sunak. <laughs> right. How was that? Yeah. Well, you, you got to be careful saying I was at private parties with the government <laughs> at, the, at the moment. <laughs> this was a, a post-COVID totally legal <laughs> because because you'll get me uh, you'll get me killed how was um, the covid party <laughs> so it was it was a very legitimate above board i'm using uh, that as a soundbite <laughs> above, board, uh, above board party so it was a a city party for um sorry a party for the kind of financial services sector right uh, i was invited with a good good friend of mine um by a good friend of mine well well club from uh, from living bridge right. um you know small handful of people Great to be in the room, not that I'm particularly affiliated with the Tory party, okay. but I've always believed that if we want to drive the changes that a lot of us talk about, you've got to be in those rooms and having the conversations with the right people. So Correct. it's good to be in the room, good to start some conversations. And to be fair to, to Rishi and the team that were there, they committed to certain follow-up and have been delivering since, right? So we haven't changed anything yet. We haven't made any big commitments right but they committed to conversations and they've they've you know they've they've been engaged which is uh which is good no that's incredible like you said again having access to those sort of right. people is there anything in particular that you're trying to achieve um working with the government in any capacity yeah de definitely i've 
I've, uh, you know, when, when I grew up, I grew up being raised in part by the community, right? So okay. strong sense of community on our estate, big community center, big adventure playground, places to go play football. Hmm. So you had a lot of positive adults around in those different places and a lot of opportunities for my mum to go to work because there was childcare or, hmm. or play center or after school clubs, those kinds of things. Um, and a lot of them are gone now, right? Most of them are gone. And I think they are the cause of a lot of societal problems because in these environments where you've got you know, a lot of addiction problems, low yeah. incomes, a lot of fathers are missing, though that sense of community often substitutes for those things. So I'm really disappointed that they're gone and I'm really disappointed that multiple governments have cut their funding okay. over time. And that's the conversation I've been trying to have, um, you know, with, with the government. Now, mm -hmm. you know, recently we went through a six month process figuring out how we were going to work together to address some of these problems. Right. And it fell over at the final hurdle, which was, you know, really disappointing, but reminded me that the work, you know, Forbes Family Group does privately and I kind of subsidize is, is really, really important, but so disappointed that it kind of fell over after six months. Yeah, that's really frustrating. It fell down in the most frustrating way, which was, you know, government saying they couldn't commit to long-term funding. Right. Right, so six months of conversation with the government about working together, them coming back late and saying, we can't commit to long-term funding. Me saying, well, if you can't fund it, give me the program and I'll continue to fund it. And them right. saying, well, no, you know, we can't do that because it will basically be seen as the government stopped and you had to pick it up and we don't want to be viewed in that way. And it's things like that that just make me so frustrated with the government, but things like that that make me realize people like me hmm. have a responsibility to pick up for the communities that we came from. No, absolutely. And what you're doing with the Fools Family Group is absolutely incredible. Uh, but I'd love to know more about the actual projects that you're doing with the, with the group from yourself. So we, we do three different things and we're in the process of restructuring Forbes Family Group because I was supposed to do all of the investing through Forbes Family Group and I actually just did it all from my own pocket privately, which which is a bad way to administer the business. Right. Um, so, so we do three things. We do um, community programs. So we've got, as an example, a set of, uh, you know, after school clubs and holiday clubs for kids, okay. which we subsidize for low income families whose parents want to go back to work or into education. Right? Right. So we're trying to help them get back to work or education. That's one example of our community work. Um, another thing that we do is, is mentoring and networking. So, you know, we were talking about the access to successful people that we have and we pursue. Yeah. I'm trying to bring my network to that group, uh, you know, as you saw at Radar, so that they can answer their questions of great people like Tim Campbell and, Absolutely. you know, Ilona and Dwayne Jackson, right? I want them to be able to speak to hugely successful people in a networking uh, environment. So we do a lot around networking and mentoring. And then we do what I call community investing. So, you know, underrepresented entrepreneurs that have good businesses that need a bit of operational support and a bit of capital. Correct. Um, we we try to provide that um, for them. It's so rewarding. I enjoy it. Dean, it's been so insightful speaking to you. Well, one of the final questions I have, and I ask all my guests on the Scale Up podcast is, what piece of advice would you give to someone looking to scale up in their, not only just their professional life, but also their personal life mm -hmm. that you've personally had from someone or that you are aware of that they can take into their life after watching this podcast that makes them better? Mm -hmm. Something that really has helped me is to, and I think I see this in people a lot, you know, people that are on £30,000 a year income, yeah, good income, you know, no, nothing wrong with that, who are thinking about how they're going to get to £10 million income. And I don't know that that is healthy because that's normally hard to do and takes a long time, mm -hmm. right? At 30 k why not think about 100 and from 100, why not think about a quarter of a million? And from a quarter of a million, why not think about 500,000? Yeah. Right? Why, why not break that journey down into manageable steps where you get constant reinforcement because you're close to your goal and then you hit that goal and then you can reset as opposed to 30K to 10 million pounds where, you know, after a few years, you could be at three or four million and you're a failure against your 10 right. million pound goal. Right. So, yeah, I kind of break things down into fairly near-term 
achievable milestone. chunks. Yeah. And then when I get to that next milestone, I reset again. Got to a billion. Now the number's four. When we get to four, we'll think about eight and then you know we'll we'll go from there yeah absolutely love that dean it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much uh, no worries thank you for and, having uh, me no it's been great and i hope uh, i'm pretty sure it'll be helpful to a lot of people good no thank you